So today I'm covering views and indexes. These are structures that help with maintaining your databases for performance and usability. Indexes are a, it's a structure and its purpose in life is to make queries run faster. That's all it's for. So I like comparing indexes to librarians. Now how many of you have gone to a real library that actually has books, not like what we've got going on here anymore? And you're trying to find a book, especially those of us that have had kids or have kids and they have a project and they gotta go find a book and they can't find the book at the library. Even though you search for it, you'll never find it, but you go ask the librarian, magically she'll walk to some shelf and pull a book out and just you. Because they know where the stuff is. Indexes are the same idea. They basically build up a structure that keeps track of where things are. And using this table as an example, which has three columns, name, age, and city, and if you do select star from person where name's equal to Smith, it does what's called a sequential scan. Anybody want to take a guess what sequential scan means? Row one is the name Smith. Row two is the name Smith. One million times you have a million rows. It's not very efficient. Index file organization stores records sequentially or not sequentially depending on the storage engine you're using. However, the index provides a quick way to find individual records. It's essentially a hidden data structure which you can't really see, you just see the definition of it when you look at the database structure. But on the disk, there's a pile of information stored. Um, primary keys are always indexed by default. Why? Because you need to find things fast if you're looking them up by primary key, therefore it should be indexed. Other fields and combinations of fields can be indexed. Those are called secondary indexes or also known as non-unique keys. So when an index is created on name, it creates something called a B tree. And for years I was misinformed and I called it a binary tree. Until I actually had someone prove to me that's not what it was called. The B stands for best. The best tree algorithm. So the way it works, Man, all these people come in late and miss the most important announcement of the day. I'm kidding. Sit. <laughs> all right. A B tree goes down four levels deep and it can fan out hundreds of levels wide. Essentially, it takes the data in your database and divides it into chunks. At the first level, it takes the database, divides it in two. On the next level, it takes each of those divisions, divides those in two, again in two, one last time in two. So anybody here ever play the game of guess the number between one and a hundred? And the most efficient way to find the answer is to divide the total by half every time, right? You go guess the number between one and a hundred, first answer should always, first number should always be 50. And of course, they're going to say higher or lower. So if they say higher, you go to 75. If that's not right, then you go to somewhere between 75 and 50. And then you keep dividing. Theoretically, you should be able to get it within five guesses no matter what. At right? five guesses, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Um, that's how B-trees work. But they do it with letters and numbers. The syntax is pretty much one of the easiest syntaxes you'll see. Create index, give it a name, on, you tell it the table and the field or fields. One field or more common delimited. So an example of a two field one is at the top. Create index, double index on person, age, and city. And there's two select statements. And don't pay attention to the double quotes. This, this slide was created for MySQL, but the concept still applies. It will select star from person where age is 55 and city is equal to Seattle, but it will not help with if you're just searching for city is equal to Seattle. Uh, just the way it sets up the data in the index, it, if you, it, only, it only helps with full sets of fields that match the contents of the index. In this case, the ind is this index has age and city. It'll help anything that includes age and city. 
But if you only have one of those, it doesn't help. Indexes also help for range queries, such as, you know, greater than 25, less than 28. And just like anything else, it's numbers. And numbers are the easiest thing to index because, well, they're numbers. Letters and, alpha and, letters and stuff are a little bit harder to index. Which leads to this question, why not index everything? Index all the things. And this is one of the first mistakes junior database developers do. They're like, my database is a little slow. I'll create an index. Oh, this query is slow. I'll create an index that matches this where clause. Well, this is slow, I'll create an index that matches that where clause. Here's the impact. Every single time you make a change to that table, you have to modify every index that applies. So let's just say you insert a new record. And of course, primary keys are always indexed. And let's just say you have three other indexes. So in total, you have four indexes. What it goes to do is it goes to do the insert. It grabs the table, finds the next spot in the table. There's one read operation. It writes the record. There's a write operation. It grabs the index for the primary key, finds its available slot, writes to it. And how many, I said three other indexes. That's how many write operations every single time you add a record. Read write operations at a minimum. And then if there's foreign keys and stuff, you know, there's more tied to that too. So for every time you add an index, you're doubling the amount of I.O. other than the primary key. Uh, other catch you have with index is they take, even though it won't take up as much room as the table itself, it still takes up room. Now, of course, people say, well, I got a terabyte drive, room's not a problem. Sure. But chat when you go and shove that on a server where the hard drives are five grand, uh, you know, five grand for a terabyte and a half of uh, high-speed storage as opposed to, you know, was it 42 bucks last time I bought a terabyte drive? Spin disk? Laptop drive was like 42 bucks for a terabyte. The, the price difference between what's put on a server as opposed to what you have in your shield is dramatically different. There's reasons for that too because on the server, the drives are designed for long life usage. They're designed for, for maximum information, data throughput. Um, they're marked because they're server parts. It's automatic, you get a server part and they're gonna throw in a little extra markup because it's made for servers. Um, but realistically, that's another reason why you don't create an index because let's just say your main table occupies one megabyte. Let's go with small numbers that are easy to understand. One megabyte. Your primary key index may occupy 100K. Your index on a person's name may occupy 200K. You, your index on postal codes may occupy 100K. Unless I had two more in there, say at 100, 150K each. Our indexes are occupying more space than the actual table at this point. So the tools used to retrieve are using up more room than the actual data itself. Now, when we talk about one megabyte, yay. Now let's go for gigabyte. Suddenly we're going for one gig to be like 2.2 .2 gig for one table because you have so many indexes. So there are rules uh, for creating the indexes and I'll go through them in a bit. Um, but there are two specific kinds of indexes. Unique indexes, which are usually the primary key index. Usually like it says on here, usually used for primary keys, but it can be used for other fields also. For example, theoretically make email addresses unique to make sure you never put the same email address in your table twice. If it's unique, it can't go in there more than once. Um, phone numbers, that, that's a little iffy. But there are things, SIN numbers, maybe you don't want a SIN, a SIN or a passport number to go into the database more than once because that might be bad. Um, on the other hand, non-unique are also known as secondary indexes. Usually when you start searching for specific things, such as zip codes is, or postal codes are common ways of a uh, common one. Email address is another common one that people index. Uh, often they'll, they'll index a person's last name but not their first name. Because often you search by a person's last name, even if you only have one name. 
We just search by your first name twice. But you only target those specific fields. All right, here are some basic rules. Normally you use them on larger tables. On a table that has 10 rows, there's nothing to gain. Primary key of each table, always. By default, when you create primary key, it creates an index to go with it anyways. Search fields should be indexes, stuff you find often in the where clause. For example, you guys were working your way through the city, searching by parts of an email address, um, ranges of things. Those are all things you could index. Anything you'd find in an order by or a group by, those are things you may want to index. And when there's more than 100 values, but it's usually not worth it if there's less than 30 values, which leaves me a range of 70 values in the middle. Realistically, your computers are so fast nowadays that even under 1,000, the index will barely give you any benefits. Uh, but essentially, if there's going to be more than 100 values and it's user, to user supplied, as in end user supplied, index it. Reference tables aren't worth indexing because they're so small. Avoid the use of indexes for fields with long values. Find a way to compress the value if you have to. Um, long values are like text fields where people type in long notes, description fields, notes, that kind of thing. Don't index those. You're not going to get any performance gains. All you're going to do is eat up tons of disk space. Uh, they actually do make special index types for those nowadays. But even that, most people don't index them because that's not usually what you search through. Um, if the key to index is used to determine location of record, use a surrogate key, such as you know a sequence or auto increment primary key, to allow it to spread evenly. Um, sometimes people will actually create an extra column that keeps track of just its position in the database, like a sort order, where you can actually create a column just to decide which way things are sorted. Uh, did you ever go to a website where you go pull down the country and they'll have like Canada and US at the top? Or depending where you are in the world, you know, China or India at the top? And every other country is sorted alf alf alphabetically? It's because they have a sort order where they've determined that these countries are worth more to be at the top of the list by playing with a sort order. They're saying, you know, that. Uh, there may be a limit of indexes per table depending on what database server you're using. Or there might be a limit of how much data you can actually index. So if, like Oracle actually has a limit on how long the field can be that can be indexed. It'll only index the first so many bytes of a given field, or it used to. I might be wrong with Oracle 12 and up. Um, the last one is nulls. If you can have nulls, don't index. Not worth it. Do is cause yourself problems. I used to have a database pre-set up, and I can't find it anymore. I lost it years ago. This course specifically index a null field. Um, it's null values get excluded from the index. So that means if you do a search and you go, for example, a city could be null, and you go, where city uh, is equal to you know quote quote it'll actually not find anything that's null. It'll actually give the wrong result set because exclude anything that's null out of the results. Because the index said, it's not there. This doesn't exist. These records do not have an actual valid index entry. Therefore, these don't exist. But then you just do a select star from the table, and you'll see all these, called these fields that are empty and all these extra rows that you thought were not there because there's nulls. Don't index nulls. Okay, um, now that covers all the important stuff of uh, indexes. Normalization is another quick, I'm just blowing through like a checklist of odds and ends topics that show up on the course outline. That's what the last two, di two lectures are for. Denormalization is transforming normalized relations into non-normalized relations. Remember. I taught you guys how to, norm to normalize, right? And it was painful for all of us on both sides of the room. And 
sometimes it's possible to get your data to be too normalized, where you end up causing a big pile of joins and it becomes cumbersome and it slows things down. So, so every, you'll want to denormalize your data. And there's some benefits. It can improve your performance. Like literally, if it doesn't have to join, it's going to be faster, especially if you're dealing with millions upon millions of rows. Because the number of table lookups and scans and all that gets reduced, therefore there's less overhead, therefore it goes faster. However, the cost, because you're now duplicating data, which is the point of normalizing, is to avoid duplicate data, it's going to take up more space because you're duplicating. Security. Remember we're talking about uh, anomalies and update anomalies, insert anomalies? You're actually bringing those risks back in by doing this. However, there are a few places that denormalization is a winner. Um, the first one is doing one-to-one -one relationships. If you have two tables that are one-to-one, -one, put it all in one table. That's just one less table you need to look through. Um, another one you'll sometimes see is associative entities being normalized. And another one is reference data, where, you know, right now we have provinces as a drop-down. It's because it's a reference table. In really big systems, they may actually take that drop-down away, and they actually use existing values in that column. They actually store up pre-canned versions of those values, and they get stored in, so there's less lookups. Um, the most common use for denormalization is data warehousing. So at the end of the day, you summarize all the data, you push it into a database. That's not part of the main transaction database. It's for what they call OLAP, online analytical processing. Uh, that's the stuff managers care about, usually not the front line people. Um, when you denormalize, there are a few risks. Uh, as I described already, you'd have a chance of introducing errors and inconsistencies, anomalies come back. And when business rules change, you actually force reprogramming at the application level. Before if the database is maintaining the data, the application does need to be reprogrammed. Suddenly, for example, you're using a static vest of values for countries. Instead of pulling it from a table, it's pre-canned in your web, canned in your desktop app, whatever it is. And suddenly, you know, a country explodes into a bunch of other little countries. Yugoslavia, for example, Czechoslovakia is another good example of countries that were bigger countries are now, you know, a couple of countries or several four to five countries. It happens every once in a while. And you, somebody would actually have to reprogram all the drop downs, push an update to everyone every time countries change. There's some countries that insist on changing every three, four years. Burma? As an example, also known as Myanmar, which becomes Burma again. Every once in a while, they just change names, depending which junta is in power. But every time the name of the country changes, you have to add it to the dropdown. Sometimes there's ways of uh, organizing it to, av to avoid denormalizing. Um, there's some really advanced techniques uh, called table spaces. Uh, which you can actually tell the database server what hard drive to put each table on so you can actually search across multiple drives in parallel. Because if I were to give a pile of cards to a group of people and tell them to sort it out, it'd be faster with four people sorting through the cards than one person's card. Right? And therefore, say, if you've got the data spread across four disks, all four disks are working at the same time, returning results in parallel. And that's stuff you'll learn in your third database course, by the way, that kind of advanced technique. Um, another thing that can also improve the performance of your joins is actually writing good queries. You'd be surprised what writing crappy queries look will do to your, to your performance, like joining every table even though you only need two, using subqueries instead of joins, that kind of stuff. All right, now. Views is the next topic. Views are used to store complex queries. If my database prof heard what I'm about to say next, he'd probably want to punch me in the head. But everybody now understands this thing back in the day. Views are like bookmarks. 
you know, you got your nice long URLs and then you add a bookmark and the next time you just click on your bookmark and woo, it brings you to this webpage and life is happy. Views basically do the same thing. You can take a complex query and shove it in the database with a name and it remembers the query for you in the future. Uh, it behaves just like a table. You can use it in joins, you can do where's on it, you can do aggregates, everything you normally do. Except you can't index it directly. It respects the indexes behind the scenes, but it does not, you cannot create new indexes on it. And the syntax is actually fairly straightforward. Create view, give it a name as, and everything that follows as an SQL statement. And this should, that, that last query should look actually pretty familiar to everybody. Right, it's the uh, last question on lab eight. <laughs> Just so you know, you know, that's the last bit of lab eight. Eh? Yeah, ID was five, but this is a join. Now I could go select star from sales staff and it would do that, that long query for me. Um, I'm just going to point a few other things. I think I cover this later, but I don't want to forget it. Um, some of the purposes of views is number one, to store complex queries like this. Two, it's also used for abstracting. In other words, maybe you don't trust your desktop developers to actually understand your database structure. So for some of their regular queries, Give them a view that's pre canned Therefore, they go select star from sales staff and it'll populate the sales staff drop down. They didn't need to know the join or what the magic numbers are. They just select star from that and magic happens. Um, it's also sometimes used for security. Really complex systems, let's go with that, as SAP or HR systems uh, or remedy. I don't know if you've ever heard the word remedy. Um, remedy is a used to be a call tracking system that suddenly became an entire application development system of some sort. It's a friggin' nightmare to work with, uh, both as a user and a developer. <laughs> she's nodding because she's experienced remedy. Um, a lot of what happens inside the database when you're creating permission views for specific people, it actually creates a canned view of what it is you're trying to grab, and then the application's smart enough to read the view and know what to display on the screen. Ish. Um, often it's, it's used for security so that you can define specific things groups of people are allowed to see, and when they go and hit the database, they actually hit the views that belong to their group, not the actual structure of the database. This should make sense for people that are learning object-oriented programming, because you know you got your classes and your objects and then you have interfaces to, to get at it and you use the interface. And you don't need to know what's happening behind the scenes because the interface takes care of it for you. Or you know, when you inherit, you don't need to know what the other class is doing on the inside, you just want to play with its methods. Same idea. And this is just another slide that covers pretty much the same thing. Um, shows an employee table with those columns. However, I want to create a view just for developers and all it'll ever show is their name and the project they work on if they work in development. It's a clean view, nice and quick, straightforward. Now there's two kinds of views. Virtual views. So when you hear someone say view, they're referring to a database, 95% of the time they're referring to virtual views. It's what I've shown you so far, the create view, blah, 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 as select statement. It's used in a database, obviously, but it's usually used in everyday use databases. It's computed only on demand. So that means it's actually slower at runtime. So if you go select star from sales, it actually looks at the query, figures out how it needs to retrieve the data, retrieves the data. So first it knows you're hitting a view, then it looks at what's inside the, the, the command of the view, and then it executes the command. There's a little bit extra being done. But the good part of it is it's always up to date because it's just a snapshot of what's happening right now. On the other side, there's something called materialized views. 
These are used in data warehouses. They're pre-computed offline and they're usually way faster at runtime, but it may suffer from stale data. Now, a materialized view is what is put into a data warehouse. For example, I like using Amazon for this because pretty much everybody's bought something from Amazon or at least browse the Amazon website or bought something from Amazon knockoffs. Insert right here. And at the end of the day, they take all the data for the day and summarize it. And then they take that summary and shove it into another database server elsewhere. So for the next day, search all the data that happened yesterday and before, but nothing that's real time. It's called a materialized. All it is is a table. It's a database table that gets purged on a regular basis and repopulated. You're going to keep adding to it on a nightly basis or you truncate the table and then get your stats, um, which having stale data. If the nightly job doesn't run, your data is stale. If you report at 10 to 12 and then it updates at midnight while you're running with 24-hour-old data, 24 data, it's stale. These views are used for reporting. That's its purpose in life. Uh, one of the contracts I worked on was for a company called Trialto. Trialto is a wine distributioner. Distributor? Yeah, we'll go with that. Based in BC. But they deal with all the liquor agencies across Canada. And what they do is they negotiate with the different vintners around the world, the different wineries and whatnot, to resell their wine to the Canadian market. Selling booze in Canada is difficult. It's not as easy as you think it could be. And, but what the problem was that they needed to know how their sales were doing every month so they could report back to their vintners saying, hey, by the way, you, this wine, you know, your Cabernet Sauvignon, 2011 is doing really well as opposed to your Pinot, uh, your Pinot Noir is a little eh. Right, so, and they'd want to know which provinces were doing better with certain kinds of wine so they could try to keep pushing that kind of stuff in there. Now, one of the big problems that we had was every Laker reporting agency in, Ont in Canada was different. In Ontario, we could get the data once a week. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta all shared the same system. All their stats went into one server, but they weren't broken down the same way because I don't know. BC was a special nightmare onto itself. Um, Quebec was the coolest. Go figure, Quebecers and their wine. We could get nightly sales, literally daily sales. Every night we could pull a file and retrieve data out of the system. Now, here's the problem. The data layout from Quebec didn't match from Ontario, didn't match from Alberta, didn't match BCs, and we tried not to deal with the maritime provinces if we could. What we had to do is create materialized views. So every night we'd have batch jobs that connected to these services, pull down the latest data file, extract it, temporarily store it in a database, build a matching view so the data structure matches the same as what we're using for reporting. And so every day we'd put down, okay, here's the liquor skew, this is the description of the wine, this is how many cases were sold, how, or actually how many bottles were sold, because then based on the skew we knew if it was, you know, six bottles to a case, 12 bottles to a case, whatever. And we built up this stat. Um, last time I checked, last time I dealt with this was seven years ago, the stats table, the materialized view that we built up at night was sitting at 27 million rows of daily information. That was five years' worth of data. Apparently, it's gotten a lot bigger since. Um, but, you know, that's what a materialized view is. So then the, the sales managers could go in the next day and look at what the, how the sales are trending across the country, regardless of the province, because they'd say, well, how well is this selling? And it would tell you totals by province. You know, what's the last three-month trend for these particular vintners? And instead of hitting... The actual raw data tables were closer to like 30 million, 40 million rows. One query could take up to two hours to run. The materialized views would allow these things to run in a minute because there were already, there's no relationships. It was all summarized. 
That's what materialized views are for. Now, views can be made updatable. Some people say, well, how can you insert data into a view? It's a virtual construct. It does not exist. It's just a pointer to something else. Technically, yes, you can create a view that's updatable. You can insert into it as long as every single primary key is defined as part of the view. Any mandatory keys or fields are also included in the view. So anything that's not null has to be part of the view. You have to supply the values to the primary key. So if you're using sequences or um, like in MySQL, it's auto increment, or Microsoft SQL Server, where it's auto built in auto increment, you can't use those. So, in other words, you're basically breaking all the functionality of your database if you want to create into updatable views. It's not worth it, not worth the effort. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. But you can do it. Those are the four rules. Okay, now. That was, the ex that was the boring part of the lecture. Now people are going to start getting stressed. Okay. This is the exam information. The practical exam is on August 6th at 3 o'clock. In other words, during this period. <coughs> All right. It is one hour, 50 minutes long. I'll actually post this as I add notes for you guys. One hour, 50 minutes. That's not how you spell hour. It is 10 questions, randomly assigned from three pools. There'll be three easy. Six, medium, one, hard. It is open book. As in, you're allowed to pull up reference material. I mean, crap, I get to Google at, all day at work when I don't know how to do something. Why should I restrict you guys from Googling or looking up at your previous labs? Not that it's going to help you a whole lot, but you could go pull up your old labs. If you just need, no, no, honestly. Um, there's a reason I'm saying that. Um, so when you come in to do this, there's some prep you have to do before you come. And I will indicate to you guys where the prep is in just a moment. You essentially will come in, you sit down. I start a timer. The exam gets released to you guys. Everybody gets a different exam. So yeah, you're welcome to talk to the guy next to you and ask him what the question to Question number, the answer to question number three is? But by the way, you're not allowed to talk. But I'm just saying, what's the answer to three? I can guarantee you're going to get it wrong because it won't be the same question. Um, only once have I ever had two students have the same exam, and they sat in opposite ends of the room. It just was a fluke. They ended up with almost like identical exams. Um, there will be an invigilator in here with me to make sure you guys aren't using chat programs, that your phones are away, that you're not whispering to each other and insert your preferred language here. Because I don't speak, it doesn't mean I don't know you're cheating. In other words, there's no talking. And I haven't noticed anybody like this in this group, no talking to yourself either. I actually had someone sit there and d discuss an entire, the entirety of the exam to the, with themselves. I actually had to tell them that I actually had to move them and sit, make them sit in the corner by themselves. Because that's literally how they functioned. Don't talk to yourself. Because the prof that's coming in to help me apparently is a bit of a hard ass. So <laughs> he will terminate your exam for you. Just saying. Um, now, for the prep. In Brightspace, suddenly a new item has appeared at the bottom left. Something called practical exam. In it, you will see four sections. You don't see the fifth one yet because it's still set as draft. This one down here, you don't see yet. There's instructions. This instruction gives you the instructions how to actually bring the database into Postgres. It's the same thing as lab one, folks. If you can't do lab one, you're in trouble to start with. 
there is a diagram. During the exam, I will have the diagram up on the screen, just like this. So you get to view it. I'll, we'll make it bigger so it's a little more legible. There's a zip file that contains the backup of the database. And then, this is the important one, practice questions with answers. And I'm not going to zoom in because you guys can go look at it yourselves. The format of this is similar to what you've experienced in labs 7 and 9, where I, I go and it, it goes and says, OK, how many of this? I don't care what query you use to get there. If you do it in six queries to achieve your goal, knock yourself out. I want the answer. Just like in the real world when your boss comes to you and says, how many sales did we have last month of this product? Do you think your boss cares how you got the answer? He just wants the answer. Same deal here. This is real world. Now, just so you know, this data is real data. There used to be a website, well, it still exists, but it's not active anymore, called FlightAware. It, I actually, where they used to offer their database up, that was slightly out of date. And it was flight information from around the world. Airlines, aircraft, airports, the routes between the, the airports. These were all real route numbers. This is actually real data with actual 100% real information in it. It's just it's now been, you know, it's been dead for five years. This data is five years old. So not going to help you if you're trying to figure out, you know, your best flight from one place to another. But it is real data. Um, it's been massaged from the original format so they would fit the structure I've been teaching you guys. Um, if it asks you for a weird acronym, you don't need to know what the acronym is. If I tell you what is the uh, ICAP for something or the ITAC or whatever the heck it is, that's literally what the column's called. I've actually had people panic because they didn't recognize the acronyms. You know what? I don't even know what they stand for either. Uh, I've actually had students actually tell me what these things meant. IATL is International Airline Transportation something or other. And there's, there's, there's fields in there that have weird names. I'm going to refer to them by name. Any of a given question, I'll ask for one value coming back. None of this, you know, what's this, this, and this. Um, and here in some of the sample questions, you'll notice that there's, you know, what's the min, max, and average? I'm not going to ask that question. I'll just, I'd ask what is the max, what is the average, what is the minimum? Now, like I said, the test is 10 questions long. There are 22 practice questions. Broken down in easy all the way down to pretty difficult, which matches the same structure as the exam. Um, my study recommendations for people for this tend to be as follows. Grab the first third, do them one day. Grab the second third, do it the next day. Grab the last third, do it the last day. Take a two-day break so you forget how you did it. And then try to do the whole thing. Um, I had students ask me, how fast can I do these questions? I, my answer was nine minutes for 22 questions. But that's because, I, one, I knew the data well. And two, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years, right? And actually, I made mistakes while I did it because I was answering a student's question during those nine minutes. So, you know, I can make mistakes doing it too. Once I came back and I realized I made mistakes, I fixed the mistakes. But if I took my time, it takes me 15, to, I'd say 15 minutes or so to do it, to do 22 questions. This is someone who does it for a living. You guys are getting 10 questions instead of 22, and you're getting two hours to do it. The, av the fastest I've ever seen my practical exam done, and it's, I've been using the same one for a while now. It's just because it's randomly generated, and every term, teachers give me more questions to add to the pool. So the pool keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, the fastest I've ever seen it done was 16 minutes. A dude got up and walked out the door. 16 minutes in, he got 8 out of 10. The average speed usually is about an hour, an hour, 10 minutes. Which, if you think about it, 10 questions is just about right. You know, it gives you 5 to 10 minutes a question. 
Shouldn't be that bad. The first couple of questions, you could probably blow through them in a minute each. It's the ones at the end. And when I say by hard, he's falling asleep. <laughs> Are we having a good nap? <laughs> um, the, what I call hard, it's not that it's any harder than, say, the medium questions. It's going to take you longer to write. So I base it on, you know, easy means, you know, you're querying one table or two. And medium, you're querying two, three tables. The hard means you're joining most of the database. But it's still possible to get an A plus on the, on the practical and not get the hard question. Because 9 out of 10 is still 90%. Okay. Uh, this, again, it's under content, practical exam. And you can get your content from there. The theory exam. Again, in this room. Saturday morning, August 10th. Oh, that's wrong. 8 a.m. Oops. It finishes at 10. <laughs> 8 a.m., folks. You're going to have to make sure you get up extra early. <laughs> okay. It is closed book. I'll be pasting this on Blackboard. And this, the second one, you should be able to see on Access now in your timetable. Okay. It is in this room. It is a closed book exam. It is on Brightspace. Now, how is it going to be closed book if you can use your laptop? A little bit of honor system happening there. What can I say? However, everybody's been wondering what the stack of yellow crap in my hand's been. I'm allowed you guys to have cheat cards. I've already printed your name on it. If you need a reprint, it's not going to be yellow the next one. It'll be a color of shame. So don't lose your card. And why is it important to not lose your card? This is your attendance to the exam. When you leave, you give me your card. And there's a spot for you to sign the card. You know what, like, you guys do tests and the teacher makes you sign a piece of paper? Crap, I hate that. Because there's always this bottleneck at the front of people jostling and, you no, know, and it's disruptive to everybody. I'm going to have a nice little box, probably right here, and you're going to come by and you go, to boop. And then you get to leave. You're allowed to use both sides of the card. Okay? Do you notice I picked a really atrocious color? Why? It's visible. If I see you with a white card, sucks to be you. And like I said, if you ask for a reprint, it's probably going to be hot pink. Not that I don't still have yellows. I'm just going to make it a different color. Um, so what's going to happen is through the week, I'll be distributing these. Um, don't grab your friend's card. Grab your own. Because this also gave me an idea of who hasn't been paying attention. So if you grab, you know, oh, my, my dude hasn't come today. I should grab his card for him. Your dude probably hasn't come in three weeks. Don't grab his card for him. He, per, I will be posting this on Brightspace that it's important to come and get your card from me. Um, there's actually more cards under people still registered because Access tells me one number and Brightspace tells me a different number. So I went with a bigger number of people. Um, some people have really long names, and I feel bad. Your signature line's below your name. It's hard to see. Uh, but uh, not that your name's really long. It was just long enough to screw it up. But that means you can still write up above it. You just need to be able to at least put your initials on the card. You can use every square inch of this. So I'm not going to say single-sided. Back must be blank. You can use every inch of this to your heart's content. For those of you that like having themselves little cheat sheets that they like having on their computer, guess what? I'm giving you one. So, so like I said, this is your attendance. If you come to the exam and you don't have your card, I'm going to make you write your name on a piece of paper. However, if you walk out the door and you didn't give me your name or your card, guess who was not here? And if you're not here, and an exam is submitted, I'm assuming you're sitting in the hall with some of your friends cheating. And I say it that way because it's happened. Where I had four people 
not show up for the exam and all four of them submitted an exam within 10 seconds of each other because they sat together as a group and did the exam out in the hall. Well, actually, I actually had someone take a picture of them on the way by. They were actually sitting uh, like on the third floor of a T building in a circle. I mean, I even have photographic evidence that they were cheating. What's great? I've never had students expelled so fast in my life. So, them's the cards. The format of the exam is bright space. Now I'm going to put this on here. It is bright space. 80 questions plus 5 bonus questions. So there are 85 questions on the exam. You cannot have more than 80 points. Bright space will top you will top you up to 80 points. So it'll go through. The bonus questions are actually on a separate page. The exam is broken down into multiple pages by topic. You can go back and forth. It's just I found it useful to actually break it down into topics. And the last page is the bonus questions. The five bonus questions are on the last page. So now what's going to happen after this, not today, but next week, is next week I'll cover the last topic for the term. And the good news is I think I decided to skip the entirety of the topic off the exam. Uh, after the topic is covered, I will be doing uh, a review. My review is a little different because I record my lectures. What I tell you what you should be studying is I'll tell you the rough breakdown of what topics and how many points. What's with this row? <laughs> One's obnoxious, one falling asleep. <laughs> I know it's warm in here, but it's not that warm. And so next week I'll be doing a review. The way the review is broken down is I'll tell you, you know, 17 questions of this, 16 questions of that. You know, the, this is what the bonus questions are like. And go. And then, so that's what I'm going to be doing next week. The week after, obviously, is the practical exam. So there's no review that day. No, it will not help you with your computer problems during the practical exam. Too bad. The last week, the last lab periods, I call it the pity party. What is the pity party? It's, I didn't do my lab. Please give me grades. And you come in and you beg for, for half points. You basically beg, beg. I mean, you show me the work you didn't do, and I give you at least 5 out of 10. Actually, at most, you'll get is 5 out of 10. But at least it's 5 out of 10 is better than 0 out of 10. But you will have to come in person. I will not accept electronic submissions because I will be closing down the labs. So you won't be able to see them because by then you already did practical, so there's no need for labs anymore. So you won't be able to submit them. You'll actually have to come in person and show them to me. That's how you get your points. So the last week is the pity party. I call it that, and you know, some people feel offended that I call it the pity party, but honestly, you've had so much time to do your labs that I don't feel bad. Okay, so... I'm going to pull the plug on this now.